Around midnight of April 2, 1982 in Croton, Ohio, a man named Michael Ross knocked on the front door of a pregnant woman. He claimed his car broke down and that he needed a flashlight and if she could spare him one. She gave him a flashlight and he left to go fix his car. But he returned a short while later asking if he could use her phone as this repair job was far too advanced for his skills so he needed help and a ride. Once inside her home he began attacking her, but this woman was an off-duty police officer and she put up a courageous fight that was able to scare Michael away. She quickly called her co-workers for assistance, and it would take less than a day for police to track him down as while he was inside her house in order to get her to lower her guard he told her his name and that he worked at a local egg farm. He was arrested the next day and charged with assault. Come to find out Michael had two previous sexual assault offenses on his record. And now with this being his third strike he would surely end up in prison for a long time. But this didn't happen. Michael would only be in jail for a little over a month before getting bailed out by his parents Daniel and Patricia Ross. He was to go to Connecticut to be under psychiatric study for a minimum of 16 days until his trial. The psychologist in charge of Michael said he was suffering from mental problems which Michael blamed on the divorce of his parents in 1981. And even with the acknowledgement of his psychological issues and two previous offenses with one pending. Nothing was done to ensure Michael was kept under surveillance or careful watch of a doctor or the police, which gave him free reign to attack any woman he pleased. Once put on trial in August of 82 for attacking the police officer the judge would only penalize Michael with a $1,000 fine and four months to be served in jail. The probation report suggesting he essentially just needed to make better use of his time by picking up some hobbies, like learning to fly to deter his violent behavior. As if a slap on the wrist like this was going to deter a man who unbeknownst to everyone at the time had already murdered three women and would go to claim the lives of eight, one of which wouldn't be solved for decades. This is the case of Michael Bruce Ross and how the system continuously failed to protect women even when there were warning signs that he was a predator. Michael was born July 26, 1959 in Connecticut and was the first of four children. He had a chaotic childhood as his mother Patricia was very mentally unstable. She got pregnant in high school and was essentially forced to marry Michael's dad to spend the rest of her days on a chicken farm. She was volatile and abusive towards her children, especially Michael, and was admitted to a psychiatric institution on two separate occasions. By the time Michael was eight years old there was evidence of sexual abuse from a teenage uncle of his, who later committed suicide at the age of 14. Despite all this Michael, actually at least on the outside, had a pretty normal life. He went to Cornell University in New York for agricultural economics and dated a couple women, he even got engaged. But this relationship like all his others would eventually end as instead thinking about building a family and living out the American dream. He started to have very dark and twisted fantasies about women. These fantasies were all he thought about and consumed his every waking moment. When he was in his second year of college he began stalking young women. He especially liked when they knew he was stalking them as he enjoyed the fear in their eyes and knowing they were scared of him. He eventually evolved to committing S.A. against the women he stalked. He did this for years without being caught until shortly after his graduation in September of 1981 he was arrested for the first time. He kidnapped a 16-year-old girl while he was on a business trip in Illinois. He dragged her into the woods and gagged her and was caught in the act of assaulting her by police officers. But despite being seen committing such a heinous crime he was only charged for kidnapping as he held her against her will. He was fined $500 then released on probation, not a day spent in jail. Getting away with his crime showed Michael that he could do pretty much whatever he wanted even if he was caught in the act he could just get away with it, with no more than a fine and probation. It is unclear how many women he assaulted before attacking the police officer but we can assume it's a lot as a man like this cannot and will not control their urges. It is quite shocking that people are put in prison far longer for lesser crimes, yet even when caught red-handed, 
with his third strike and for attacking an officer of the law at that, he was still set free. Well after another joke of a sentencing hearing for assaulting the officer, Michael went back to Connecticut after his four-month jail sentence. He was now essentially free to do whatever he wanted even though he showed a pattern of abuse and had documented psychological problems. No one was watching him and of course he ended up lying about his criminal record on his job application while job hunting, which is how he started working as a door-to-door -door insurance salesman, which he was able to keep even though every time he was around women his partner would say he acted very bizarre, and it's suspected while doing his job is how he spotted some of his victims. 19-year-old Robin Stavinsky was hitchhiking in Norwich when she suddenly vanished on November 19, 1983. A week later some joggers were running near a local hospital when they discovered her remains, and this was the case that brought investigators to the conclusion that they might have a serial killer on their hands. Detectives working Robin's case were able to link her death with that of Tammy Williams and Deborah Taylor. All three women were of a similar stature, had been essayed, found face down and strangled. Tammy Williams was from Brooklyn, Connecticut. She was walking home from her boyfriend's house January 5th. 1982, when she was abducted and killed. She was found not far from where she was taken. Witnesses say they saw her struggling with a man and in that spot was where they found her missing pocketbook, then she was gone. And even though Michael went to school with Tammy and she always took shortcuts next to his family farm, he was never a suspect and Tammy's case went cold. 23-year-old Deborah Smith Taylor was driving around with her husband near Danielson around midnight on June 15, 1982 when their car ran out of gas. The two split up and walked in opposite directions hoping to find a gas station. And while out on her journey she decided to sit down at a park bench along the way. That's when Michael pulled up, kidnapped and killed her before dumping her body in a dried-up river bed where it took four months for her skeleton to be found by a jogger. And the reason investigators thought these two cases were connected was that Deborah went missing three miles from where Tammy was found, so it seemed like either two killers had the same M.O. when hunting ground or there was just one killer connecting these two women. And of course you don't want to immediately jump to the conclusion of a serial killer because that means there will be more bodies, and people like to hope that these are isolated incidents because it feels safer than the reality that women are being hunted down. Then on Easter Sunday, April 2, 1984, 14-year-old friends April Brunei and Leslie Shelley were hitchhiking home after they went to the movie theater, but they never made it back. Michael upon seeing the two girls walking alone offered them a ride to their destination. And the girls made the fatal mistake of accepting, they told Michael to take them to a specific gas station but he drove right past it, which is when April pulled out a knife demanding Michael stop the car. Michael said he was initially surprised by this but he was quickly able to disarm her before taking them to a remote location. He told Leslie to get into the trunk of the car where he bound her hands and feet. Then he took April out of the car s her, strangled her before placing her body into the front passenger seat. He then went to the trunk for Leslie, he dragged her out of the trunk and told her he was sorry but he had to kill her. He strangled her as well then dumped them in a culvert in Preston where they would be discovered two months later. Leslie was the only victim he didn't essay but said it was the most enjoyable since it was the most like his fantasies. He would take the life of his last victim 17-year-old Wendy Barabo, June 13, 1984. She was last seen by witnesses walking down State Highway 12 to a convenience store around 4 p.m. It was a bright and sunny summer day and Michael was on his way home when he saw her walking on the side of the street. He got out of the car and started walking next to her while striking up a conversation. He was dressed in a three-piece suit as he had just finished work which made him look less threatening. He was in the middle of trying to convince her to go to a company picnic with him, and when there were no cars passing by he dragged her into the woods next to the road where he beat, essayed and strangled her. Her body was found a couple days later buried in a stone wall close to where she was killed. And because this was a busy highway in broad daylight many witnesses saw him and told police they saw a thin white man with glasses driving a blue late model Toyota, following her in his car on the day she disappeared. They had enough people who saw his face to actually do a composite sketch, 
which was the break in the case investigators were hoping for. Detective Michael Malchik, who worked on Tammy's case, was assigned chief investigator of Wendy's case. He thought the killer must be a local as Wendy was buried, and in his experience killers after a murder want to flee the scene as soon as possible, to avoid getting caught. But this killer taking the time to hide the body, meant to him that the man must be comfortable with that area. So they tracked down all of the local blue late model Toyotas in the area that matched that description and came up with 3,600 names. And they didn't have to look too far, coincidentally. Michael Ross was the first name to pop up on this list, and he lived only three miles from where Wendy was killed. So when Detective Malchik went to talk to him he was already suspicious and when he finished talking to Michael he just knew he had the man that eluded him for the last two years. He described their encounter as being a roller coaster ride because whenever he was about to leave, Michael would drop some breadcrumbs to get Detective Malchik to ask him more questions. Eventually Michael was unable to hold his secrets in any longer and he confessed to the murder of Wendy Barabot, and once in police custody he confessed to murdering April Brunei, Leslie Shelley, Tammy Williams, Deborah Taylor, and Robin Stavinsky. And since understanding the psychology of serial killers was still in its infancy, only about 20 to 30 years earlier is when it arose as a separate area of psychological research, so many psychologists were interested in studying Michael and understanding what drives serial killers, and how their mind works. So in the couple years before his murder trial he talked to multiple doctors and psychiatrists, and according to Michael his mental illness began when he was a child. Before he even reached puberty he was having fantasies, where he would kidnap women and take them to a safe place and then the women would fall in love with him and never want to leave. Once he became a teenager is when his fantasies would take a sexual turn and he started to molest several girls in his neighborhood. After spending time with Michael, many psychologists diagnosed him as a sexual sadist, which is when someone derives pleasure by inflicting physical or mental pain on another person. Many psychiatrists believe he developed these tendencies due to the problems he had with his mom which is probably what led him to have such negative and violent feelings for women. They also believed he had a hormone imbalance in his brain and when that was coupled with a hatred for women it made for a deadly combination. Michael often described his violent urges as a separate uncontrollable entity, and these urges would just overtake him and he would do things he knew were wrong. He felt like that part of his brain was an obnoxious roommate that he couldn't get away from, and while he would get orgasmic pleasure from thinking and acting out these fantasies, he would later be disgusted by the same thoughts and was full of a sense of self-loathing and self-hatred, which caused him to express some suicidal tendencies. He said when he was in jail he would get off at the thought of his crime so frequently he gave himself sores. So he was put on a couple female birth controls to help reduce his urges by decreasing his testosterone to prepubescent levels. Which actually helped and reportedly Michael was able to grasp the full extent of his crimes. He said he felt guilt towards the families and was haunted by their pain but he knew there was nothing he could do to fix it. And some of you may be wondering what's going on that there were only six victims he was charged with, not eight. Well. Michael was not completely forthcoming during his confession in 1984 and it wouldn't be until a few years later during one of these therapy sessions that he confessed to the murder of 25-year-old Zung Nag Tu in May of 1981. Zung was someone he knew from his school days at college. She was a Vietnamese exchange student at Cornell University. She was extremely smart and studied a lot. On the night she was killed she had been in Warren Hall studying the same building where Michael was working at the time. It was late and many people had already cleared out, so he took the opportunity to do what he had done with so many other women before. But for some reason he decided to strangle her, which resulted in her death. She was his first murder victim, her body was found May 12th at a gorge close to the school. And her death was initially thought to be a suicide because that gorge was known for being a spot for jumpers to end their life. Her case was cold up until Michael confessed, but he was never charged with her murder in addition to the six others. After this murder he also reportedly tried to kill himself, but he was too chicken to do it and just tried to convince himself he wouldn't do it again, which worked out really well I'd say. 
In July 1987 was Michael's trial for the murder of Deborah and Tammy. He pled guilty and received a maximum sentence of 120 years. The following month he had his trial for Wendy, April, Leslie, and Robin. He received a total of two life sentences and six death sentences. This made Michael very angry because he felt the witness testimony was faulty and inaccurate and that he wasn't given a fair trial as valuable evidence from the psychiatrists of his psychological problems wasn't allowed in court, and that could have made sure he wasn't given a death sentence. So he appealed and his case was taken to high court. In July of 1994, the Connecticut Supreme Court decided to uphold the murder conviction but overturned his six death sentences finding that the original judge excluded evidence that might have helped Ross prove he suffered from a mental illness or defect, so the court said he needed a new penalty hearing. It would also be this year, while he was giving a BBC interview he claimed that he committed two other crimes. Now this incident was unclear as to when it happened specifically and if it was before or after the assault of the 16-year-old in 81. But Michael said that there should have been nine victims because shortly after his graduation he was living in North Carolina and his fiancée came down to visit and it wasn't a good visit. So when he saw a woman walking alone with a stroller in her neighborhood, he knew he wanted to attack her to vent his anger. And when she got into her driveway, they made eye contact right before he grabbed her and started attacking. He threatened her saying if she didn't comply he would smash her baby's head against the side of the house and after he was done he strangled her and left her for dead, but she ended up surviving to his surprise. He also said he killed a woman up in New York. He gave some details about where he left the body and the police found a case that matched his M.O., the case of Paula Pereira. She was described as being bubbly and carefree, but despite her normally cheerful demeanor due to problems at home that peaked in 1981, she would actually try to commit suicide by overdosing on pills. She of course survived and from that point on she was bullied at school. People on the bus gave her the nickname Tylenol. And while the comments didn't bother her too much, some days she just didn't want to deal with all that negativity so instead she would hitchhike to class. Paula's boyfriend would beg her not to and said it was unsafe and dangerous, but she ignored his pleas and said only nice people pick me up. March 1st of 1982 would be the last time Paula caught a ride. She left school early as she was feeling ill and wanted to rest at her boyfriend's place for a little bit. That's when she came across the Cornell student Michael driving home from spring break. She was never seen again and her remains were found 18 days later, tossed into a marshy area on the side of the road. And while police tried to solve her murder, it went cold and was unsolved for two decades until Michael said something. And this was the era where DNA was up and coming. So before they pinned a murder on him that he could be lying about they decided to take Paula's clothes out of evidence to test the DNA against Michael, and since he was already in jail there wasn't really a sense of urgency either. And apparently after this interview with BBC he supposedly had a revelation that he was a monster who deserved to die and spent four years working with state prosecutors to circumvent the new penalty hearing he was granted in 94. I didn't really feel anything. I mean, I knew what was going on, and, and I saw what was going on, but it was more like watching an old film that we used to see as kids in the high school. You know, I mean, in elementary school, they've been played so many times, they're all spliced, and, and it'd be going along and then jump. You would think that if you killed somebody, that you would have that face imprinted in your mind, and that you wouldn't be able to get it out of your mind. I don't have that. I never had that. The only only face that I can see is what was in the newspapers a few days later when they were when they were missing, you know, like the high school picture. Anybody know where this girl is type thing. Um, that's when I think of them. That's the picture I see. I don't see them as they were when I killed them. I can't see them as I was killing them. When I say I don't have any remorse, that doesn't mean that I don't have any regrets that I don't wish that didn't happen. That there was something I could do to bring them back or anything. He now believed he deserved the death penalty he was originally given. He wanted to make an agreement to proceed right to the death chamber and on March 11, 1998, he signed what was essentially a death pact with the state prosecutor. He acknowledged his crimes were cruel and heinous and thought it was best to hasten his execution. However, a superior court judge disagreed with Michael's sentiments 
and thought this death pact was unconstitutional and unsettling, and said they needed to wait for the new penalty hearing that Michael was desperately trying to avoid, and in case any of you hybristophiliacs are in support of him, thinking that he's changed and trying to take accountability for his actions, you're wrong. His retrial began in April of 1999 and that same month he all of a sudden had a change of heart and no longer wanted to die, so the defense team went back to trying to get his original death sentence convictions overturned, by saying his mental illness was a mitigating factor, making him ineligible for the death penalty. It took three days for the prosecutors to present their case and they used Michael's own words from his BBC interview in which he described how his victims suffered to try and seal the deal of getting a death sentence. Of course Michael's dad was on his side and argued that his son was more useful alive so he could be studied, but given the strong case the prosecution had, Michael's defense basically placed all their bets into the psychologist whose testimony was barred 13 years earlier at his first trial, saying that Michael's mental illness should be considered as a mitigating factor. It took nine days of deliberation and on April 6, 2000, they came back with another death penalty sentence for the murders of April, Wendy, Robin, and Leslie, which of course he appealed and while his death penalty sentence was pending appeal he was extradited back to New York to be tried for the assault and murder of Paula Pereira. And on September 24, 2001, he pled guilty to first-degree murder, and was sentenced to 8 to 25 years in prison. Zung was the only victim of Michael's that he evaded charges for. Investigators thought there was no point in charging him as he was already sentenced for so many others and Zung's family in Vietnam had no interest in pursuing the case because they, understandably didn't want to relive the pain that tore their family apart. During his BBC interview in 94, you can really see just how sick Michael Ross really is. There were times when he was laughing, recalling how shocked the medical examiner was at the injuries he caused to one of his victims, he took pride in the strength he had to kill them. He also said that serial killers strangle their victims because there's more of a connection, it's more real, and it's not as quick. And maybe this is the sexual sadist in him, but he also told all his victims after he assaulted them, that if they turned on their stomachs, he would tie them up and let them go. And I don't know if y'all are aware of how hard it is to manually strangle someone, but it takes about 33 pounds of pressure on the trachea to completely close it off, and it takes about 4 to 5 minutes for the brain to die, which is a long time to apply that amount of pressure in the right area, especially from behind the victim, and that was the method Michael chose on all these victims, he chose a method that is his own words is so personal and intimate and he gave them hope of survival before violently taking that hope away and ending their life. He said there was not a single chance for any of his victims to live, they were dead as soon as he saw them, and it didn't matter what they said to him, the ending would be the same. So I would assume this was all part of his sick fantasy because watching someone fight for their life is more gratifying than someone who's given up because they know the end is coming. And it's precisely because of this interview that I'm so confident he didn't feel any remorse for what he'd done. And I don't believe someone like him can be rehabilitated. I just don't. It truly is so shocking and vile the crimes he's committed, some of which he was basically given a free pass to commit. But thankfully for the families on May 13, 2005, 18 years after his arrest, he finally got his earlier wish of death by lethal injection. He was the first person executed in the state of Connecticut in 45 years. Nine members of his victims' families witnessed his death, and he chose not to make any final statements, which says everything you need to know about him really. And it's just so unfortunate that so many women had to become victims for him to be brought to justice. I blame the judge that sentenced him so light on this third strike, it's clearly a pattern by that point, and flying lessons aren't going to fix a monster. If he had been sentenced harshly, five of his victims could still be alive right now. Well, that is it for this case, I will see you all next week.